try something different. Normally, I like to preach from the pulpit. I am a creature of habit and routine. I enjoy it. I like structure. I like things to be regular and normal. I don't like things off the cuff and out of the ordinary. So I like preaching from the pulpit. But you know, today was different. And even more so as I drove here, I just felt like I needed to spend some time with you and to, to communicate with you and gather around God's gifts and spend a few moments with you, not so much my notes. So, as I continue, if I trip and fall through the sermon, here's the plan. We step through the mess, we keep going with the service, and we act as if nothing happened, okay? So that's the deal. But I'm happy to spend a few moments with you, just you and me. You know, uh, one of the things that I so enjoy about flying, I fly on the side. I have my private pilot's license. And you might think, like, you're nuts for going up in a small plane. At most, we have four seats. It weighs about 1,600 pounds. And we have one engine. So why in the world go up in something like that? And you know, what gets me is the moment where I taxi out onto the runway. And there's one particular runway at MacArthur that I get the best view from. So I love when the wind's facing that direction and I get assigned that runway. And it's when I taxi out and the tower tells me I'm clear to take off that my plane starts to speed up and the quicker it goes, it starts to lift off the ground and something stops, not the engine, but something stops and it's my mind. Because you can't think about anything that's around you on the ground when you're flying. Otherwise you'll crash. The only thing you can do is listen to the voice of the tower, watch your instruments, and pay attention to what you're doing because their job is to guide you through Long Island's airspace and get you safely around all those Southwest 737s that some of you are sitting in that I'm flying around. And you know, something happens as we get higher and higher. I look out the wing and if it's that right runway, I get a view of my own house, and I get a view of my own neighborhood, and I can see all the churches and Sable and the Main Street, and then, you know, as we go even higher, something else happens, and more of Long Island starts to come into play, and then I see the Long Island Expressway, and the further I go up, all of a sudden, there's Nichols Road going north to south, and Montauk Highway stretching from MacArthur Airport all the way out to the very end. And then, as I go up even higher, like, my plane is a back window. Sometimes it's not too good to look out the back window. It's a little scary. But if I look out the back window for a second, still paying attention, I see the ocean behind me. And there's nothing but ocean as far as you can see for the eye toward the south. And you look to the right towards Montauk, and Long Island just ends, and it's nothing but ocean. And the further you go to Connecticut, as they clear you out, you start to see all the roads start to come together and fit into this big puzzle. And all of a sudden, the roads form this big web that flows into Manhattan and then over bridges and you look to Connecticut and then there's the sound right there and then rivers and then off in the distance, more mountains and cities and you see the whole continent of the US come together. It's just amazing. And it's at that moment that you stop for just a second. And it's almost as if it's you and the Spirit of God in the right seat next to you, if there's nobody else in the plane. And I begin to think, you know what, God? Is this what you see? And is this how you see life? You get that entire big picture of everything that's out there, and you see how it all comes together. Are you at all concerned with what's down there? And you know the truth of it is? God is. God's the God of all of that beauty that comes together and that great big plan that fits together in cities and towns and rivers and all of creation. And yet, at the same exact time, he winds up there on a cross because he's also the God of our moments, the God of our struggles, the God of our strife and that rough path that we walk through in life. And so God doesn't want to be just above it. God is in the midst of it with us. And so God comes to the cross to die. Because God cares about 
the moments we live on earth. You know, the gospel reading is a little strange today. It's a little otherworldly, I would say. You know, Jesus starts talking in strange language about foxes having holes and, and birds of the air have nests to lay in, and yet the Son of Man has nowhere. He's homeless. And you know, that's just weird. And the reason why God is talking like that is because he doesn't want you and I tangled up in the world out there that's all full of all of those things we make our every day at. All of the plans, all of the struggles, the conflict, all of that. You know, God's the God of all that, but doesn't want you and I to be caught up in that. So God talks about otherworldliness and the fact that you and I are part of a reality that is so much greater than you and I could ever realize. And so God says, don't get caught up in that. Don't get, God, don't get caught up in earthly life. Keep your eyes fixed on me as he moves to the cross and as he moves to the empty tomb. Because your lot in life is not just what you see around you. You have so much more ahead of you. You have an eternal life. And so he gets, he gets really like a New Yorker, Jesus does in the gospel. And he gets kind of in your face with what he says. And he even goes so far as to say to some guy, look, let the dead bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. That's tough. That's like a law statement. You know, in church we have law and we have gospel. And the law confronts us so that we can come to the gospel and have the comfort of the peace and resurrection of Jesus to know that all is well and that God has paid for it all in spite of our failures. But he's being so upfront saying a life that's consumed with all that stuff out there and with all of the moments that we make out of life are really nothing. And they begin in time to turn in on themselves and they get us to turn in on themselves so that what we call life kind of becomes God. And we no longer leave God on the cross or on the throne of our life where God belongs. We try and put ourselves there. And so Jesus is saying, no, don't, don't go there. Such a life turned in on itself, not looking up towards God, not being filled with God, is a life that is spiritually dead. And Jesus doesn't want that for you. Jesus wants you to live, and to live fully. You know, the Apostle Paul so beautifully dovetails and expands on Jesus' message in his letter to the church uh, in the Galatian uh, community. And you know, one of the things that happens to us in our Christian life, one of the most beautiful moments is the moment of our baptism. Did you know at the moment of your baptism, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit come to live with you? Jesus said so at Pentecost a few Sundays ago. He talks about, he talks in the plural, that we will make our home with him, with the child. So Father, Son, and Holy Spirit come to live within us. They come to invest their, themselves in our life at the very moment of our baptism, and they don't leave. And so Paul expands on that beautiful ministry of the Holy Spirit in our life, and he says, listen, the fruits of the Spirit are this, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things, because those things are the, the, the very things of the Spirit of God, the very aspects of the breath of God, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and they are yours. And there is no law against you when you live in these things and live in your baptism. And so Paul says, don't get caught up in a life that is this worldly and tangled because you heard what those fruits were in the epistle lesson, didn't you? Conflict, envy, strife, all that stuff. Do you really want a life full of that? Well, God doesn't want that for you. And 
And so Paul exhorts us, tells us, calls us, live today one more moment in the power and presence of God's Spirit within you. One more moment today in that love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, kindness, faithfulness, and self-control. Live one more moment today in that than you did yesterday. And then the day after that, then another day. And keep going. And let God walk with you. And bring that into your life. All the way to eternity, church. All the way.